Hi there, and welcome back. Today, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about Theodore Dreiser, really important 19th century American novelist, also a, a strong practitioner of one of the literary movements we'll talk about today, which is naturalism. We'll also talk about the ways in which naturalism and realism are different from each other, and also to clear up um, how there are differences among those two terms when we're talking about literature um, in comparison to when people just talk about maybe something being realistic or naturalistic in general. Um, these are very specific um, movements with very specific elements to them. And we'll, we'll, we'll find something similar going on when we get to modernist. Um, modern is a word that gets used a lot. Um, but when it comes to literature, strictly speaking, it refers to um, a fairly coherent set of structures and philosophies and themes. And the cat just ran by me. Um, I've been evicted to wherever I could find a plug in my house. So um, I know there's a fan whirring above me. I'm getting some weird kind of guillotine complex. But we're going to move through this. Stay. All right. So there he is. Doesn't look too happy. Uh, he had a lot on his mind here. Okay, hold on. Let me get rid of the cat. And what do we need to know about him? A little bit of background information. Hello. So, he is a Midwesterner, born and raised in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, did not have a happy childhood. There were lots of different reasons for that. Um, it's a very large family. There were financial struggles. Um, but he was a bit of a brooder. But he was also a very avid reader and very, very much um, current with these new disciplines that are arriving in the 19th century. Um, uh, social scientists, psychologists, sociologists, even anthropologists. And he's talking, and one of his big ideas is that um, natural laws are what guide, if not outrightly control, how people act and what their final stories ends up being, what their actions are and what their destinies become. And this is very, very different um, from previous centuries where it's all about what is coming down from a divine force, whether it be um, providence or God or something of that nature. Now, Sister Carrie, boom, published right at the turn the 20th century. And like uh, other really important texts we've looked at, its language was considered raw. Um, what that basically means is that it talked about um, people having adult relationships outside of marriage. And it does it in very frank psychological and sociological ways. And that's, that doesn't mean it's a sterile text at all, not by our not by our contemporary standards, but back then to just kind of analytically discuss these things and the psychological forces and the sociological forces um, that uh, help contribute to these states of mind and these actions and these destinies, well, that's too much for the day. Um, the other large point is that its characters often escape punishment for behavior that is not considered moral. And that includes sexual behavior. And immoral sexual behavior right here we're basically talking about is sex outside of the confines um, of a happy, heterosexual, child-bearing marriage. So a lot has changed on that front too. Um, but Dreiser is really important because he uses these burgeoning fields of psychology and sociology and even anthropology to talk about how um, Carrie and other characters, including Charles Drouet, um, are kind of buffeted and rocked back and forth, not only by psychological urges, think about Freud here, um, but also by sociological patterns. And if you uh, look back at Sister Carrie and the reading, you will notice that she is kind of in love with the big city. And we get a lot of um, omniscient narration about what's going on in Carrie's mind. And we also get um, ex 
explication from this omniscient narrator about how the city has a uh, tendency to uh, overwhelm those who are not used to it, um, the young impressionable minds of America, seduce them even. And you know, this, this also feeds into like a lot of literature and a lot of mythology about the metropolis that's emerging in the, in the early 20th century. And what we can also add to that is um, one of the ways in which the city seduces is through a seemingly endless parade of goods and services, things you did not even know you wanted. If you go to the city, you're gonna find them there, right? And uh, Sister Carrie does take up work at uh, a sh at a very important uh, department store in town. And early 20th century, late 19th, is when department stores as we know it really come to be. Bon Marché is probably one of the very first, and that's in Paris, France, I think 1880 or so. But anyway, it becomes this place where you find things you never even know that you wanted. And this happens to Carrie too. So we, we not only get to see her finding all this kind of, uh, all these uh, unknown or previously unknown desires for material things, we also get commentary um, from this omniscient kind of uh, psychology and sociology narrator talking about this too on the kind of effect it has. So some really important kind of structural and organizational themes being brought in here, the city, uh, the department store, uh, the metropolis um, and consumerism too ties into that really obviously and we also see it in the description of Charles Drouet the masher um, what we'd probably call the player whom she meets on the train right we get basically a head-to-toe description of what he is wearing right so much that it paints a very vivid and elegant picture it could be something like out of GQ or out of ah, the cats again. Are we done? Okay. Um, out of GQ or um, Esquire, if that's still around. Um, maybe Men's Health, do they have clothes in that? Anyway, the whole point is it becomes about this outward symbology. You know, if you want to be a certain person, you can buy your way into it. So we're talking about the rise of consumerism too. And consumerism is a huge title, if not oceanic force in this book. And it is in our lives as well too. What we think we can accomplish by what we spend is a very, very powerful element. We all know people who try to um, climb that next rung up on the social hierarchy by how they spend and how they show that spending. Conspicuous consumption. Little bit of a digression, but this is just to talk about, you know, this really, really rich um, uh, archeology span that goes into Carrie as a character. And sadly, we've only got a small excerpt of this. We don't really get to see um, what happens to Carrie later. I, I encourage you to read a synopsis. She ends up dashing Charles Drouet away um, and becomes a star, but she will just consume and get rid of people that she does not find necessary later on, too. This leads us into our larger talk we're going to have about realism and naturalism. Got one more point here since it comes up. <clears throat> and Dreiser's reputation still rests firmly today. <clears throat> He's still considered one of the most important naturalists. And I, right now, I think it's a very good time for us to talk about what the differences are between realism and naturalism. Again, in very popular commonplace terminology, <clears throat> they might seem like synonyms. But when we're talking about literature, especially American literature, they are fairly separate entities. So, on the realism side, we've got people like Mark Twain, William Dean Howells, um, Henry James, Edith Wharton. And on the naturalism side, we've got people like 
Stephen Crane. Uh, Stephen Crane you might know from, say, The Open Boat or The Red Badge of Courage. Pretty bleak stuff. Frank Norris um, with The Octopus. Upton Sinclair with um, The Jungle. Jack London with To Build a Fire or A Piece of Steak or even uh, Call of the Wild. Just made into a new movie version with Han Solo. And uh, on the realism side, we know about Twain already. William Dean Howells, Henry James. Edith Wharton, you might know from, say, um, Ethan Frome. So realism is, in general, a genre or a movement that's very concerned with social manners and norms. What is considered acceptable behavior, especially for those in the middle class. And naturalism, on the other side, is digging deeper. It's talking about the things that really organize and move, but also exploit people within a certain culture or society. And it's really, really coming down hard on industrial wealth in middle and upper classes. And keep in mind, this is a time where there is a huge gap in wealth in the U.S. Um, the, the gap now is greater at this point, but the gap became so steep so fast that it, contained, that it, it caused all kinds of turmoil um, and social tumult. Think about the big barons that are coming out through this age. You've got your Vanderbilts, your Huntingtons, your Stanfords, Carnegies, all of these people and their philosophies and uh, the structure that makes them possible are what is getting held to the fire in naturalism. And in realism, um, we have commonplace and believable settings. And we don't really get that, um, say, in the Twain that we've read. But, you know, Huckleberry Finn, very realistic, right? Um, commonplace is a better term. Um, it's a place that you can't imagine really existing. And with naturalism, you see this kind of uh, pushing away from the norm, from believability, to more extreme, uh, harsher settings. Sometimes ones that seem to have like um, a brutal kind of outwardly expressed emotional content. They can, um, they can border on surrealism in terms of their not normalcy, right? Um, but in a terrible, creepy way. And in realism, we, we have at that focus middle-class characters. Um, uh, people that are in the middle of the social strata um, leading middle-class lives. But in naturalism, we tend to see something different, which is lower-class characters. So in other words, um, working class, poverty class, lower middle class, um, in general, trying through, uh, trying to make things better for themselves, you know, working their hearts out, but not understanding what is going on perhaps around them. Now, as we continue through the plot of realism, what we will see again and again is that by the end of the story, the end of the narrative, the end of that plot arc, in general, everybody ends up where they should be based on their behavior, their morality, and their beginning social class. So it makes sense. Everything kind of ends up in, the, in, in, in a nice order to satisfaction. Now, in naturalism, on the other hand, plots just kind of unravel and ripple and cause chaotic consequences for all kinds of people involved um, to or very close to our main characters, our protagonists. And we do see this Darwinian influence here. Uh, Charles Darwin is very important. Um, of course, uh, scientists during this time and social Darwinism becomes a theme that gets interjected into fiction and other forms of art, even though Darwin makes it very clear he does not think that it works that way within um, human social settings. It's about physiology and anatomy and behavior, not about societies as they were. Okay, looks like 
We are almost out of time. I'll stop it at there and get ready for the next one.